And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. Coming to us, coming to me all the way from the other side of the pond, and dealing with and dealing with time zone hell, as well as well as uh, as well as really as well as really bad old pop songs playing when they shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> the the man who is the man who is very capable as a DM and a designer, but it, but is better known as Ian Capel. I had to get that joke out of my system. How you doing? Fair enough. How are you doing today, man? Uh, I'm well, thank you. Yeah. It's not that. It's not that uh, that bad. It's only uh, six o'clock my time. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's just just time zones are my personal hell, and mm -hmm. <laughs> especially given recent announcements when it comes to Australian time zones, it's going to be worse. Mm. Are they? Oh yes. Because you you probably heard about how they're um, how they're splitting Australia Australian Central into two thirty minute time zones. Oh, no, I hadn't, but God knows. Um, Australia is very odd with time zones anyway. For example, uh, Queensland doesn't have a uh, summertime, so they don't change their clocks at all year round. Um, I used to live in Queensland, and the reason for it is it upsets the cows. I thought I thought they'd do it because it, because it upsets the cows, <laughs> really? It, yeah, it upsets the cows. The cows don't like having their uh, milking times changed, so uh, Queensland... Doesn't doesn't change to uh, summer summertime, for example, summer or winter time. For the rest of the world, we change our clocks, but Queensland doesn't because uh, they don't like upsetting their cows. And that's a fact. You can look up. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I don't. I believe you, but I'm sure. But I'm. But I'm from the Midwest, da dairy set, dairy central in in North America, and I'm trying. And I'm. Tr I'm trying to. Vi I'm trying to visualize that. I'm trying to visualize that issue. Um, of course, of course, the smart, the smart ass side of me wa wants to say that the reason that they don't is there is they don't want to incur the wrath of the emus. Mm. <laughs> because even after all these years, I, I will, I still find jokes about the Great Emu War. <clears throat> but so when when I last when I last had you on, um. Fires of Athelin was looking was looking very um very sta very standard D twenty in term in terms hey. of how, in terms of how it was approaching. But from what I understand, you guys have been moving away from some of the um more strict avenues of the D twenty system. Yeah, um, originally well, last time we spoke, when the first time we tr uh, uh, tried our Kickstarter, FOA was strictly a 5e SRD system. So we were working off the, the backbones of the 5th edition uh, open source license. Um, and after that, uh, obviously, when the pandemic hit, um, when the pan pandemic hit, when we, we were first starting FOA up, um, it gave us the opportunity to sit down and look at it and really analyze it. Um, even though our, our, our sorcery system was there, we, we still had the same core tenants of, and in many ways, the same uh, systemic issues that other D20 systems had. Um, so sitting there looking at it from a structural point of view, to, on, I'll be honest, it didn't reflect the game that I wanted to build. Um, it was still, and a lot of people like fifth edition, and that's completely up to them. It still had a lot of clunkiness to it. Um, so we put it aside. Um, we sat down and we looked at not just fifth edition, but Pathfinder, and maybe thirty or forty different uh, uh, tabletop RPGs, and we went through and we looked at certain common trends that existed throughout them all. For example, most games, even if you look at uh, White Wolf, um, whether you're playing Werewolf or uh, Vampire, um, you, you're you still kind of caught within a specific structure. You're either um, a Fenris or w whatever type of vampire you choose or whatever type of werewolf you choose. You're still caught within a pre-prescribed structure. Um, and I'd always wanted to create a game that was more sandbox that put you 
put put the players and the games masters more in control of your player, of your character, um, because the way that most games work um, is you, you, the player, create a character background or a backstory, and then all you do is essentially bolt it onto a pre-prescribed class. So we use... Dungeons and Dragons, and that's the model Dungeons and Dragons always used, um, all the way back to fr- first edition in the very beginning of the game. You had pre prescribed classes with pre prescribed skills, and essentially all you were doing was bolting on top your character background. Mm-hmm. Um, and I-, I wanted a more sandbox approach where um, your character. The skills on your character sheets and things and the abilities your character is capable of is reflective of your character's backstory and the adventures they've been through. Um, I've never, I was never a real fan of the level and experience concept. Um, so we took a few lessons from reality and we said, how do we as human beings uh, learn and grow and evolve and develop? Um, so we sat down and we went, well, the best way to achieve what we wanted was to simply strip out the concepts of levels and classes and go with a complete sandbox system within a simple and elegant um, structure that would allow people to create backstories, create, uh, develop a skill set that matched their backstory. So when they begin their adventures, their skills are representative of the character they're playing as opposed to the class the class based systems where your character's skill set isn't really re- um reflective of your backstory unless you force unless you're essentially forced to create a backstory that matches the class in the book whereas in FOA we took the approach of we want you to create class characters that are representative of your story and then you go off on your adventures and you can essentially let your adventure shape your character as it goes so ownership and creative control of your character is so in foa's perspective put into your hands so you have ownership you have control and we did that by developing a very simple skill-based system where your character in a very organic and natural fashion, goes off on their adventures, they meet NPCs, and they learn skills. Uh, You pick up the basics, and you practice them, you um, use them under duress in combat or um, certain situations, you can can even learn from other players. So it's a a very authentic and organic character development system. Um, And the acronym for that is OCD, but we Probably we'll find a new one, but it got st- we, we, we had it and it's, it's stuck. Um, so our OCD system mm-hmm. was designed to give creative control and ownership of your character to you. So it's no longer a case of you looking at a character class and going, oh, but I want to do this, I want to do that. You can literally do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way our skill system is designed is is very, very flexible pretty much any skill or any skill in reality, any, anything we do can be broken down into somewhere between two to four basic levels. Your basic understanding of a skill, an intermediate knowledge of a skill, an advanced knowledge of a skill, and mastery of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so whether it's sword play, um, picking up a sword for the first time and learning how to stand and the length, getting used to the weight and length of the weapon, which will give you basic proficiency in it, or computer programming, um, basic understanding in programming, learning like basic C, C++, and then working your way up to specialized programming and even up to then branching off to becoming a hacker and using your programming knowledge to write uh, computer software or hack or do whatever you want with it. So pretty much any skill you you that exists can be broken down into a number of tiers so even if it isn't in our player's companion you can say to your games master um i want this skill and foa is essentially a 
um, the book version of it anyway is a high fantasy system. Uh, we don't have any, shall we say, financial skills. Um, but if you want your character to be an accountant, um, and one of our testers did say that and take me up on that, and sat down, oh, yeah, we broke down accountancy into three tiers. Um, so basic accounting, book, standard double book cookie, double book geeking, double book geeking, and more advanced levels of accounting. Mm. And that was it. It was really is that easy. So pretty much any skill that you can devise or think of, whether it's a skill founded in reality, and let's face it, the vast majority of role-playing games, most of the skills are founded in reality, um, can be translated into FOA. Uh, and that also had what we found to be a, a very uh, helpful side effect, make, meaning the basic structures of FOA are transplantable into any genre, whether it's high fantasy, low fantasy, um, sci-fi, post-apocalyptic, um, even modern day. So any time frame or time zone or genre, whatever you want to call it, um, the structure of FOA is easily transplantable. Um, thus meaning you can play FOA in any setting that you as a games master and players feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the our epiphany moment. Um, and once we did that, um, said, well, the classes have gone, the concepts and levels have gone, um, why don't we throw out the spell lists as well? And um, we'd already developed our sorcery system, so we spent some time refining um, our magic system. So out went 300 odd spells that I'd spent hundreds of hours writing and rewriting and developing and balancing. Um, and in went our sorcery system. So FOA went from being your standard D20 model uh, to being a very sandbox and open and creative environment. Um, and then it truly looks like the game that I had always wanted to play. Mm -hmm. um, we brought in a load of testers um, and the response was practically unanimous. Uh, there were one or two people that found it a little too... Oh, sorry, one second. Sorry, there we go again. Um, some, sorry. I have no idea what's going on. My <laughs> computer's just, my computer's just gone blank. Ah, technology. Uh, it loves to give us the middle finger. Yep. Yeah. But. Yeah, my, my screen is just, uh, can you hear me fine? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's fine. I'll just leave it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, that's that was kind. Of... Sorry about that, folks. The we had a bit. We had a bit of a snafu. Um, yeah. Yeah. Apologies about that, folks. That was uh, my fault. My laptop yeah. decided to reboot randomly. Windows for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, with it, with that kind of. Th when it comes to when it comes to freeform character creation, um, something that something that's always in the in the back of my in the back of my mind, especially especially um, seeing how seeing how people approach it over the years, is is um the is the tra is the trap of archetypes, which you can you kind of hinted at earlier when you mentioned um when you mentioned rigid rigid classes, and as much as as much as I keep picking on it, I I have to bring the, I have to bring this up as an example. Um, Shadowrun. Shadowrun, on paper, is a free is a free form character creation system. In pra in practice, however, people are still playing to certain archetypes. <laughs> yeah, um, that's uh, I, get, uh, I, 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 I I carry on. Like people, like people will people will identify themselves at, or identify their character as a hacker or a street sam or a, or a mage or a rigger. Or if they're or if they're desperate, a technomancer. But that, that I'm getting ahead of myself. 
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree on that concept. And in, in the end of the day, there's nothing that anyone can do because that's a, shall we say, that's a um, side effect of people playing, constantly playing class-based systems. Um, one of the things that we, uh, we, we outline quite clearly in um, the Games Master's Companion, um, as well as the Player's Companion, um, and that is um, your title is just what you call yourself, whether you call yourself a guardsman or a fighter or a mercenary or a healer or whatever. That's just your job title um, in the end of the day. And I, I do take a little bit of a, a swipe in the Player's Companion to the old second edition uh, TSR um, Player's Companion when, obviously, some people will know, um, in the migration from first edition to second edition, the old assassin class was um, shelved. Um, and there was a little line in the Player's Companion that said, um, assassins are no longer a character class. They're considered to be um, a job description like farmer or merchant. Um, so we've taken pretty much the same approach. Um, whatever you decide to do in life, that's just your job description. You are essentially just you. You are a human or an Orgat or an Elenar or a Silvar or a Daishi, just any one of the races out there. You are a person. You are an individual. Um, what you want to call yourself is completely up to you. Yes, um, certain people will uh, pick skills specific to their job. That's natural. It's no different in the real world. Um, you won't become a doctor without having a specific skill set. You won't become uh, a computer pro a computer programmer or a, a network penetrate race in Chester without having a specific skill set to get there. Um, but what FOA's sandbox uh, skill system does, it allows you to essentially become anything you wish to be as opposed to being pigeonholed into being a fighter, being a rogue, being a wizard, being a cleric. Um, and every fighter, every rogue, every wizard, or every cleric, skill-wise, essentially being the same. Maybe you, depending upon what system you're playing, there will be a few variations and you'll have a few choices. Um, in FOA, your choices are almost limitless. Um, you can take your character in whatever direction you wish. Um, you don't even have to have, um, don't even have to map it out and plan it. You can essentially create your character, um, whether it's a basic, seasoned, veteran, or epic character. Mm. Those are the four four tiers that we four tiers that we use. But if you're starting a basic char character and to put it in some kind of uh, frame of reference that other people will understand, basically a level one character. So all you've got is your backstory the skills that represent your backstory. Um, and you're going on an adventure, on your adventures for your very first time. Mm -hmm. um, you don't even have to plan it from that point onward. You can quite literally let your adventures shape your skills. And the things that you learn, you go off on your adventures, and you may discover, oh, um, my friends aren't very good at medicine. We don't have a medic in the party. Um, all these injuries we're picking up are taking too long to heal or we're at risk of dying from infection or diseases. So having someone with medical skills in the party could be good. So you can learn that. And then you can cross-skill it by teaching somebody else in the party medicine, mm -hmm. um, medical skills. And um, you don't just learn from NPCs. You can, you can essentially teach each other skills. No different in real life. Um, so it had that authentic, we have that authentic edge, that organic and authentic mm -hmm. um, edge to our skill development. And you can, as mentioned, you can be, you can call yourself whatever you want. Um, I can call myself uh, a brain surgeon. doesn't mean I am a brain surgeon um, or I have the skills to reflect it. Um, whereas the class systems, you are a fighter, you are a rogue. You are defined your skills and what your character can do. It's defined by what's written in a book, essentially. We've taken those shackles off and said, well, off you go. Um, create your own characters. Take ownership and creative control of them. Um, just call yourself whatever you like. Mm -hmm. 
Now, with that in, with that in mind, one per, one particular trap that often happens in free in free form um, character creation and advancement is what we call analysis paralysis, um, where where, some, yes. where, some, where somebody <laughs> is um, where there's so there's so many potential choices that some but that somebody ends up having a hard time p picking one because they don't want to have that particular choice screw them over a few levels down the road. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How, um, well, uh, the, uh, the how, how do we solve that? Um, I'd, I'd, say how, I'd say how do you minimize it because it's impossible to completely yeah. solve it. Yeah, we, we, we have attempted to, to, as you say, minimize it as much as possible. Um, we did have a couple of people um, during the test period over the last year um, who admitted to analysis paralysis. Um, but when we sat down and spoke to them after going through character creation a couple of times with them, one of the things they admitted is because it was a different style of thinking and a, an approach to character creation. Um, so you look at all these skills. The thing, uh, thing that we say in the Games Master's Companion, as well as reference it um, a, in a little less detail in the Player's Companion, because we want Games Masters to be able to work with their players and help them develop them, um, is don't think too far ahead. When, you, when you're going through character creation the first, first time, so especially when you're creating your basic character, just think about the skills that represent your story. So if your character was a peasant farmer, um, just go for skills like meteorology, because if you're a farmer, you have an understanding of the weather. Um, you might not have a scientific understanding of the weather, but you can determine weather patterns in your local area. You get a sense of when it's going to rain, like roughly how long it will rain and things like that. Agriculture, um, herdsmanship. Um, and maybe you've got a little bit of a background in there where at some time you've learned how to use a long sword or a short sword or a long bow, whatever. You, you learned how to use a long bow to go hunting. So your skills represent the story that's written on the paper. So you've already defined, essentially defined your skill set. So you don't have to overanalyze what skills you want. You only really suffer in, in a way from analysis paralysis is if you're thinking too far ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and as mentioned, once you start your adventures, just let your adventure shape your character. As opposed to going, right, I want this, 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 and this. So that I can power game my way through the system. Um, and if you want to do that, fine. Feel free, go ahead. Um, but the one thing we say is, let your adventure shape your character and not systemics shape your character. Because um, that way, you will, in the end, you will find your characters are more organic. And that's why one of the reasons why we called it organic character development. You go off, you learn things. And pretty much any skill, because all of our skills, as mentioned, are broken down into a number of tiers between two to four, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and every tier has a prerequisite. If you want a tier two skill, the prerequisite is the tier one skill. Uh, tier three, obviously, prerequisite is tier two. So there's an organic progress. There's a linear progress through the various skills. Mm -hmm. um, so... It is possible to develop analysis paralysis, but we took a lot of care into um, giving guidance as to ways to avoid it. And the way to avoid it is don't look too far ahead. Yeah. Um, as, as an adventurer, when you, when you, certainly if you start as a basic adventurer and you get randomly caught up in an adventure while sitting in a pub, which happens oh so often, um, you have no idea what the future holds. Mm -hmm. So... Just go with it. <laughs> now, with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'm, would it be fair of me to say that the uh, that the advancement that you do have is a uh, is a is a um, for lack of a better term, currency based approach? The whole XP is currency kind of thing. No, we we have no experience. Um, you essentially go begin your adventures. You wander around the world. You meet people, whether they're NPCs or other players, and you start learning things. So your adventure is the story. That's the approach we take. 
your learning process um, is continuous, much like life. So you begin your adventures, you start picking up skills. It takes time to master these skills to be able to reach 100% in a skill because so it's considered mastered. So you don't have to make various roles to um, achieve any bonuses from the skill whenever you use it. So you're constantly developing skills. And when you've finished learning one thing, you move on and you learn something else. It is possible to learn a certain number of skills at any one time. But if you're trying to juggle too many skills, it's very difficult to evolve quicker. So it's a, systemically, it's kind of easier to learn like one or two skills at a time. And then you can just move through them um but that's the whole process is again much like real life we went to school we learned six seven eight eight subjects at a time whilst at school maths english physics chemistry etc art computer programming whatever um then we finished school went to college again numerous subjects at a time and then we started our jobs and we started to develop and learn skills within our various careers um, and that's the same approach we've got. Our skill system is very, shall we say, again, our buzzword, very authentic. It's grounded in reality. Um, so it's got that logical, um, authentic edge to it, which makes it very easy to pick up. Um, so there is no experience. Your adventures are just your story. Um, and the skills you learn along the way are based upon the various NPCs or things you pick up from other players or um, your story helps define them. As I mentioned, you may go off on an adventure and suddenly discover that you don't have a medic in the group. Um, so it'd be really good to find someone uh, to teach you uh, basic physiology so you can determine wounds and basic uh, uh, physician skills, basic triage skills, so you can um, diagnose injuries and stuff like that. Um, so you go off and you find a physician um, and say, can you teach me, please? Um, and that in itself creates role-playing moments because you have to go through that whole role-playing exercise and interacting with the physician and charming your way into his life to the point where he'll teach you. Um, and then you get the role-playing exercise of the actual teaching process. So it's all, it all comes back to, it's all kind of designed to flow into generating as many role-playing moments as possible, which is why we say the new version of FOA is very role-play centric. We've kind of, everything we've built into the system is designed to sit there in the background and bring role-playing more to the forefront because one of the things we noticed in a lot of other, in our analysis of a lot of other role-playing systems, especially certainly other D20 systems, is the system sits on top and um, a lot of the time, pushes role-playing to the back because mm -hmm. um, the, the systemics, pretty much everything you want to do, and certainly in certain other D20 systems, um, requires a dice roll. Um, I want to jump over a table, make an uh, acrobatics check. Um, I, want to uh, I want to persuade the uh, shopkeeper to um, give me a better price, make a persuasion check. It's check, 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 and it becomes a dice rolling system where the mechanics of the system get in the way. Whereas we wanted a system where the mechanics sit in the background and push all those role-playing opportunities, the learning experiences of teaching each other skills. Whereas as a games master, you get to sit there and watch the players interact. Um, or even as a games master, you get there to interact with a player or a couple of players. When you're teaching them sword play or teaching them defensive the difference between defensive and offensive stances. You get to have that role-playing opportunity. Again, you get to see players interact when they're learning and developing their skills. When, for example, say we'll say a couple of martial characters, a couple of fighters in your party as a games master, you sit there and you watch them spar mm -hmm. in the morning. Yeah, they make a few systemic roles, but they're interacting as people. So you're creating those role-play moments. Um, and everything, we, everything we've done uh, throughout the system it's kind of gone back to that core tenets of um, it's called a tabletop role playing game, and the role play should be the most important word in that 
ac uh, in that acronym. Um, whereas in a lot of systems, even going all the way back to the, the old school systems, not so much. A lot of systemics were sitting on top. And whenever you wanted to do something, it was reliant on a dice roll. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted a system that had role playing at the front. Um, and so we went all hog with it. So pretty much everything you do, obviously, if you start a fight, then there are a number of dice rolls involved. But our combat system is designed to be, again, creative in nature, allowing you to be a little bit more expressive. Our sorcery system is designed for you to literally let, allow you to make magic at the tabletop and come up with anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Um so again, that's a role-playing opportunity. That's a chance for you to interact with your games master to tell them what magic you want to conjure into existence, um, ex justify it to them by explaining which skills you have, um, justify you having the knowledge to do that because we take the approaches from a skill perspective. If the sk if the, your character doesn't have that skill on their character sheet, then you don't know it. Um, you might have heard in Naaman, for example, sorcerers, you may have heard of sorcerers teleporting across the world. Um, but if you don't know how it's done, it's very risky to try it. And again, to put that in a real world um, perspective, I personally know nothing about cars. If I open the bonnet of a car, I can go, right, there's the battery. I think that's where you put the water in for the radiator. Um, outside of that, it's broken. Um, yeah, let's call the AA man. Um, <laughs> that's that's reality. Uh, and we've all been there. And our skill system is reflective of that to give you that intuitive, authentic approach that pretty much everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think I went a little bit off on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, it's, it's, it's all interwoven. We've made sure that everything we've done from a systemic point of view um, connects. So even though we may be talking about sorcery, it's still relevant to bringing that role play perspective to the fore. Um, our, like for example, we've completely removed the charisma statistic. Mm -hmm. It's gone. It's out of the window. Don't need it. There's no such thing as social skills. If you want social skills, and role playing is supposed to be a social, a, a form of social communicative storytelling, then talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's all about. Um, so there is a, an entire chapter in the Games of Master Companion dedicated to helping de helping people develop social skills and for game masters to be able to. Because we've all been there. Every game master in the world. Um, every DM, storyteller, director, whatever you want to call it, has had one person or a couple of people in their groups throughout their time that have been a little shy, a little introverted, introverted or just new to the group. So they tend to sit in the background. Or And even when it comes to them interacting, um, they're tentative. So it's like, how do you engage that person, bring them in, bring them into it, immerse them in what's going on. So just simple tricks, like when they ask you to do something, for example, oh, I want to, we'll use the same example. I want to persuade the shopkeeper to give me a better cry, price. Mm -hmm. So you just ask little questions like, um, okay, so what do you say? And then you just coax it out of them. And in doing so, they become involved, they become engaged. Um, and then you get to a point where, right, um, Okay, I, I want to learn this. And you go, okay, so um, your friend over there knows how to do that. And then you get them engaged with somebody else around the table. Um, and that those more engagements, not just for that shy introverted person, but everybody around the table should hopefully improve everyone's role-playing experience. Because at the end of the day, the whole process that we go through is all about developing those role-playing, those personal social engagements, those interactions. And the more that we could push the systemics of FOA to the background, so it helped 
develop and evolve and push more of those role playing and more interpersonal and social engagement, the better, because that's what we're here for. We're here to interact, role play, not roll, not just roll dice to resolve everything that we want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, with I'd like to I'd like to delve a little bit into talents. Um, okay, and where the where the okay. dividing line between talents and skills are. Okay, um, yeah, uh, the primer probably needs a little bit of um, clarity in that. The difference between talents and skills are skills are the things we learn. Talents, much like in reality, talents are the things that you are naturally gifted at. So you can be a natural talented uh, athlete. So you can be athletic, which means it's easier for you to learn strength-based skills. You can be uh, a logical thinker, which means uh, it's easier for you to map out research projects um, and learn intelligence-based skills. But that's the whole point. Talents are just things that make it easier for you to learn skills. Because if you're a natural athlete, then sport com becomes easier to you. Um, if you're uh, an intuitive thinker, then sciences and math is easier, to, easier for you. So that's the thing. And if you're ambidextrous, then things like learning dual weapon proficiencies and dual weapon skills or anything that not like juggling or anything that requires um, dual hand-eye coordination is easier for you. If you're a natural acrobat, you've got a, a better sense of personal eco. Um, so that's talents. Talents are things that give you a natural edge in certain areas. Um, and de depending upon your games master, they may just say, okay, I'm going to give everyone two talents. Or they can just randomize it and say, okay, everyone gets 1d4 talents. Just to, much like reality, not everyone in the world is talented, is talented, as talented as everybody else. So there's just that randomization to it. So talents are things that, as mentioned, give you an edge at learning specific things. Because every skill um, has a stat um, assigned to it. So if you're learning meteorology, it's um, an intelligence or wisdom-based skill. If you're learning a weapon skill, if you're learning to use a two-handed sword, um, it's strength-based because over time it will develop your strength swinging a claymore around for two hours every day. Um, if you're learning... Um, just sprinting, if you're just trying to improve your move, uh, movement rate, so you're just going off sprinting or doing long, dur uh, long duration runs and stuff like that, and that will improve your constitution. So um, talents make it easier for you to learn something. Uh, that simple. And skills are just skills. These are the things that you learn, and your talents support your learning process. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with, that in, with that in mind... I'd like to sh I'd like to shift into um, combat. Okay. Now, I know that I I know that um, every everything that you do in combat is an action, and that leads that leads me to one that leads me to one question that I think is going I think is going to come up fairly fairly easily. Are you are you leaning for theater of the mind, or are you leaning for um, grid for a grid system? Uh, both. It works fine in both. Um, we've tested it in Theatre of the Mind. We've tested it in uh, 2D and 3D virtual tabletops. Um, so whatever way you want to do it, it's fine. Um, if Theatre of the Mind is superb. It's great. Um, and again, with Theatre of the Mind, there's more role-play opportunity involved. Um, one of the things that like having minis and virtual tabletops or even like physical minis um, tends to do is take away that imaginative edge because people see the map uh, or they can see the, the built map on the table. Um, so they tend to like switch off little parts of their brain, their imagination, which builds up that picture for you. Um, 
but yeah, um, it works equally fine in both, um, for, certainly from my perspective. Um, there's no issue with playing in theatre of the mind. Um, just it's from a systemic um, balance point of view. One of the things we didn't want, and certainly with other D20 systems, um, and even like some uh, systems outside of the D20 genre, one of the things we, we noticed from our analysis, and a lot of that was done by watching a lot of Twitch streams as well, mm. to see how games are working today, um, is combat was always tended to be very clunky and long-winded. Um, and one, again, this comes back to our point about engagement and immersion and trying to get people involved as much as possible. Um, and I think I may have mentioned it, uh, well, certainly wouldn't have mentioned it last time because we were still on the, like, uh, the old 5e style. Um, and that is uh, one of the biggest examples uh, that, that I set was I sat down and I watched all five and a half hours of the end of campaign one for critical role, the big fight against Vecna. Um, that was one combat, 10 rounds of combat in five and a half hours. Um, and Travis, who played Grog, had 11 minutes of personal interaction in five and a half hours. Now, I don't know about anyone else. I would have been thoroughly bored out of my head if it took a good 30 minutes between me getting to do something. Um, because we were 5 ESRD and fighters had three or four attacks around and there was always lots of dice rolling involved. Um, and it takes 20 minutes for every wizard to argue about the interpretation of the spell in the book. Um, it was, it's essentially ridiculous. Um, that's not enjoyment mm -hmm. because you literally get people sitting there playing around on Facebook or sending out tweets or just doing something and waiting for 20 minutes uh, to do something and get engaged. Uh, so we wanted to streamline that entire process to make it easier for people to be engaged, easy to, uh, not easier, but to, to make people more immersed, to make people more engaged into what's going on. And the easiest way to do that, everything you do is one action. Mm -hmm. That's it. You get to do one thing per round. Um, and under test, under testing, uh, even on stream, we've had fights that have lasted 10 rounds, the same as the Vecna fight, with far more NPCs on the table. So we're talking five players, uh, somewhere between five to eight NPCs. So somewhere between 10 to 12, 13 actors for all intents and purposes per scene. Um, and those 10 rounds take an hour and 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and that keeps everybody engaged because that reduces what we call um, combat speed, the time per time it takes to complete every round to less than 10 minutes. Um, and that means by the time you've had your turn, he's had his turn, player A, B, C, D have had their turn, the GM's done their little bit, everybody's used their reactions because in FOA you're at re you will use your reaction quite often. Um, so you're constantly being engaged, whether you're a fighter parrying, whether you're a sorcerer um, performing a contest of wills trying to counter the magic that is being used on the battlefield. Um, your, those engagements keep you immersed in what's going on. And because that combat speed is very quick, we get to end of turn one, we're into turn two, you roll a new initiative, which gets you immersed and engaged once again. Again, you don't have to wait 20 minutes before your your turn takes place. Um, and that's, that engagement should hopefully fuel enjoyment as opposed to you sitting there for 25 minutes, just waiting for your turn in the initiative order. Now with the, now with that in mind, with that in mind, um, you've, you've set up a loca you set up a locational, um, health set, health approach. 
Yeah. When with I've in similar instances when I've seen these kind of things, um, some game some games will rent. Some games will have you, will have you pick for the location you're aiming at. Some will, um, ra some will randomize it. Um, how do you, how do you have it working? Both. Um, we have skills such as precision and arcing precision, which allow characters with a certain level of martial skill. So if you've got, if you are skilled enough with a weapon, then you are skilled enough to be able to determine where you want your blows to land. You're patient enough to wait for that opening and attack that specific area. Um, less skilled um, exponents, not so much. Um, so if, you, if you're not skilled enough to have the skill called precision, then whenever you land an attack, um, it's just a case of, oh, there's an opening, I'm going to go for it. So you roll randomly to determine which location has been struck. But if you have the precision skill, before you would roll your attack, you can declare where that attack will land. Mm -hmm. That's simple. Now, with, now within that... Um, with count with whenever whenever it comes to doing combat, there's there's a cer there's a certain type of tone that people want to go for, whether or not they whether or not they want to go for something a little bit a little bit more over the top, or if they want something that has characters to be a bit more squishy. Um, given the fact that Fires of Athlin is supposed to be a dark fantasy, are you a are you aiming for a, for a lot of um, low HP encounters where um, characters can't exactly be all that tanky? Um, we've kind of tried to find a middle ground. Um, no characters in the FOA don't have a huge amount of hit points. And no, your hit points don't change a great deal between your basic character when you begin your basic adventures and being an epic character. Because um, your hit points only really increase when your constitution bonus goes up. Um, so characters that um, develop uh, con-based skills are round about the only ones that see their hit points go up. Um, but you're not overly squishy. It still takes a couple of blows to each location before they stop working. Um, and you've got enough hit points to be able to be um, a little more aggressive um, if you want to. Um, but it's still, we, we wanted that gritty kind of authentic edge to combat where... Um, there is a risk to it because two people standing in front of each other swinging sharp pointy swords at each other. There's an element of risk to it. Um, and we wanted people to be able to feel that. Um, and one thing you could certainly do is when the, the sword starts swinging, you can quickly see um, by just looking at your combat tracker and your little crash test dummy that's on your character sheet um, how the fight's going, you can look at it and go, oh my god, I've been hit there a couple of times, I've only got like one or two hit points left on my arm before it stops working, oh my god, next time I get a hit in the head, I'm going to pass out. Um, so that you get that kind of authentic feel and that like grit to combat. Um, yes, FOA is certainly more dangerous when fights start compared to systems where you've got 300 odd hit points. I mean, the only way, the only way to really kill you is to drop a mountain on you. Um, but we didn't want that. We wanted a game where you literally are, when the fight starts, um, you're sitting on the edge of your seat, you're immersed, you're involved, you're seeing your 60, 70, 80 hit points, whatever you've got, in some cases 40 or 30 or so, um, start to trickle away. Um, and there's lots of things in there that can help mitigate damage. For example, um, anyone proficient with a weapon is capable of attempting to parry a blow as a reaction. Mm -hmm. As long as you're proficient, the concept of attack and defense is considered part of being proficient with a weapon. Um, so we wanted that, grrr, that okay, like combat is real, it's dangerous, like, for example, We've got an injury system. If anyone was a natural 20, they get to roll on a critical injury table to determine what type of injury they inflict. And depending upon your type of weapon, whether it's a slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning weapon, will determine 
the types of injuries, obviously piercing weapons tend to cause more bleeding damage. Um, blood, uh, bludging weapons tend to cause breaks. They tend to break bones. Uh, slashing weapons, they kind of like do a mixture of both. They can cause bleeding, um, cut deep enough to chip bones and damage nerves and stuff like that. Um, so we wanted that kind of edge to it. Um, and that, that was it. We, we wanted a balance where that it is gritty. It, there is drama. Um, you can see what's going on just by looking at your character sheet. Um, and that helped build the combat narrative, that scene inside your head. Um, as opposed to just going, okay, I did, I hit him, I did 50 odd points of damage, but he's got 700, so uh, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, next, and waiting 10 minutes, 20 minutes before you get to go again. Um, so we didn't want people to be super squishy because that's a turn off for anyone. Uh, but we didn't want people to be so powerful. Um, the way it scales is regardless of whether you're a basic character or an epic character, combat still takes pretty much the same time. In fact, at the higher end, at the epic end of the scale, combat is probably more dangerous. Well, certainly more dangerous and certainly doesn't last as long. Because if you took two master swordsmen mm -hmm. and put them in a room and said, go for it, that fight ends when one guy lands one or two blows. There'll be a lot of parrying, a lot of posturing, but it only takes one or two blows, successful blows from one one of those swordsmen to end that fight. Mm -hmm. That's authenticity. That's reality. And we've kind of got that same authentic grit to it. So you're sitting there, you're immersed in what's going on because there is that risk, that fear factor of what's going, what could potentially happen. You could die. Um, but you're not super squishy where you die when you get hit once or twice. Because, mm -hmm. again, you don't have a lot of hit points, but nobody does a super amount of damage. <laughs> so you don't really get anyone... I think one of the only few potential combos capable of chopping arms and legs off in a single blow um, takes... I don't know, years of adventuring to be able to design and master. And then you can only really go wander around and chop up random peasants. Yeah. <laughs> now, with that with that in mind, um the ne the next angle that I'd, the next angle that I'd want to go into is is the is the magic system that you have. Um sorcery. Now since you since you had mentioned the whole the whole thing about pruning through spell lists, would it be fair of me to say that the sorcery system that you have is more is more folk is more focused on building effects rather than drawing from a set list? Um, there are no lists. We have no spells, none whatsoever. Um, so essentially, you um, as a sorcerer, um, your magic is in your hands. Uh, you can attempt to do anything that you can imagine, anything you can personally think of. Mm -hmm. um, there are structures in place to stop you. And obviously that single statement in and of itself is insanely powerful. Um, and one thing that I was very clear doing from the onset was making sure everything in FOA is balanced. So giving, you, giving players and games masters the ability to create mountains um, create suns or whatever they really want to think of. Um, there had to be serious checks and balances in place. Um, so magic in FOA isn't reliable. Every time you attempt, as a sorcerer, attempt to create magic, um, you have to essentially force or convince the universe to allow you to do so. Because the universe is a very fickle thing and it doesn't like being mucked around with by pesky morals. Mm -hmm. um, so from our perspective, there needed to be checks and balance. So the first major check was spell failure is a real thing. Um, so regardless of what you're trying to do, whether you're attempting to charm said guardsman by using a bit of um, telepathy and psychology on him to convince him to let you pass or cut and draw up a son. Um, 
you have to succeed on a sorcery check. And your games master is com complete control as to what that sorcery check is. Um, and it's it's what we call challenge rating uh, to succeed. Uh, and they've got a friend. Games masters have a framework for determining it. Obviously, the more powerful thing you want to do, if you want to create a sun, that's significant. That's major. Um, but you also need to have that understanding of what you're doing. And I touched upon that earlier um, with the reference about me not knowing how to uh, repair a car. Um, and sorcery works on that same premise. If you know what you're doing, it's easier. So again, charming the guard, having telepathy, having that ability to project your thoughts uh, into the mind, understanding psychology, and being able to essentially, essentially use your sorcery to beguile the guard. If you've got telepathy and uh, psychology as skills, then that's easier. Um, if you if you're trying to create a sun and you have no idea what you're doing, then your challenge rating will be a lot higher. Um, and because you don't know what you're doing, you have no bonuses to attempt to help you achieve that. So the risks of failure are higher. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's the chance that you will roll a natural twenty and create your sun and incinerate yourself. Um, Hey, that's that's the odds. Um, there's always that five percent chance, that natural twenty, that will say, "Congratulations, you've succeeded in your magic." Mm -hmm. um, so all magic is achievable, um, but there is a risk that you will fail, um, and depending upon how much you fail, will determine the outcome. You can pick up things that's known as sorcerer's fatigue. Um, for a sorcerer's fatigue that you've got, there's uh, an excrement. Uh, um, there's a penalty to your sorcery, any future sorcery checks until you've had a chance to be able to rest and recover. So one level is minus one, two levels is minus two, three levels is minus four, and so forth. Up until a point where you can achieve what's known as burnout. You've recovered so much, you've accrued so much fatigue, you've burnt yourself out of your ability to summon your will and create magic. And that means your character is magicless for one calendar a month, 28 days. Mm -hmm. So that's the balancing factor. That Though you have that awesome power in sorcery, we've made sure there's enough downsides and side effects to bring it back into balance just to be able to say to players, yeah, you can go off and be stupid if you want, but don't complain to your games master or us if it doesn't work mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so we want again as mentioned earlier everything we've tried to do in foa um has a sense of game balance to it mm -hmm. and much like i said before there's that five percent chance that you will roll a, a natural 20 and your magic will just work equally there's the five percent chance that you will roll a natural one and your magic will go spectacularly mm -hmm. wrong we have a thing called feedback. You roll a natural one, or you fail your sorcery check by a large number, and you suffer feedback. And that's essentially the universe's way of pushing back and saying, F you. Mm -hmm. um, at which point you are literally in your GM's hands, at their absolute mercy. Because, mm -hmm. again, depending upon what you're doing, again, if you were doing option A, charming said guardsman, and you suffered feedback, then Nujim might just say, okay, you've given yourself a bit of a migraine, roll 1d4, you take that much psychic damage to your head. Because mm -hmm. what you were doing was just small. If you were creating a sun, um, and you suffer feedback, the GM might just go, okay, you've just turned yourself to ash. You were trying to control and manipulate that much magical energy. Um, and when it channeled itself back into you, poof, sorry, but those are the risks you take as a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how, we, how we've how we dealt with like, the magic side of it and making sure that it's balanced. Um, there are no spell lists. Obviously, a lot of people will who have played other like, role-playing games will have a sense of what types of things they can do. But again, your, the limit of what you can do um, is your imagination and essentially the skills that you have on your character sheet. Your 
again, as previously mentioned, your skills define who you are and the things that you're capable of. There's nothing stopping you as a sorcerer attempting to use your imagination and use your magic in, in uh, an imaginative way. Just the risks of doing something that if you don't know how to, how, how to achieve it are higher. Mm-hmm. Now, with, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the Player's Handbook and the GM's Guide, respectively? Okay, uh, the Player's Handbook is around... 150 pages uh, because um, the actual core rules of the game are only 57, 58 pages, something like that. Obviously, when you chuck in artwork and fluff them out a bit, that goes up to like 60 or so. Um, but we also added a lot of uh, campaign lore. Because obviously, um, we have our own game world, uh, the FOA universe, mm-hmm. uh, Athlean itself, uh, which the, the game is titled after. Um, so we wanted to add a lot of campaign lore as opposed to writing an entire new book, um, a campaign guide. So we wanted to put enough, uh, campaign lore in the back of the, in the appendixes, uh, section of the book for players to be able to create character backgrounds that are immersive to the world of Athlean. Obviously, if the games master has gone off and create their own homebrew world, then your GM can provide you with that background law to be able to create characters immersive to their world. Because immersion is a, a huge a word for us. It's right out there with authenticity. Um, so you've got that. Um, we've taken some of the old class concepts um, and then we, we've we added them to help give uh, framework, not classes, but they're there to act as a guide. For example, if you wanted to create a character that would be a pathfinder in the old system then we've given you a guide as to what types of skills you would like uh, that would flesh out that character um, but they're not there to be classes they're there simply as a guide a concept guide because a lot of people certainly people that are going to be brand new to FOA as you mentioned they might have that analysis paralysis so having a few concepts to be able to go, okay, this is what a shadow stalker assassin would roughly look like. Mm-hmm. Um, even though they won't, because every shadow stalker assassin in the world will have their own individual set of skills. Um, but here's a framework for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got that in there. We've got all the lore uh, for the world of athlete and countries and some of the organizations and knightly orders and monosatic orders and stuff like that. Um, and the Games Master's Companion contains the hushed, hushed uh, game lore. The Games Master's Companion itself is around 120 pages. Mm-hmm. Um, there's because uh, as well as um, the guides of how to uh, social interaction, um, how to manage combat, how to uh, create monsters on the fly, how to um, create encounters on the fly. So. Pretty much all the tools and tricks that we've learned in the development process of FOA have gone into the Games Master's Companion, along with um, some what we call advanced races, like the KTN, which is uh, an insectoid-type race, which the Games Masters can implant advanced rules on player character vampires and lichens and liches, um, which we call states, um, because they're not monsters. Uh, in our universe, lichens are naturally evolved creatures, as are vampires. Mm-hmm. Lichdom is a, a slightly different uh, philosophy, uh, state of being, but they are there. So there's advanced rules, as well as our epic, epic battle system, which allows you to um, or role play out epic battles, things that um, you don't get to do very often, because the world of Athlean itself is one that tends to have the odd war every now and then. So we wanted a system where players and games masters can act out these battles and resolve conflicts that will essentially um, shape their game worlds. Um, and again, as mentioned, a few quiet lore stuff that the, only the games masters should really be privy to, but once people read the book, everyone's privy to, as well as world building and campaign building tools to help GMs be able to create their own worlds 
inside the UFA universe, as well as outlining all the core systems like the uh, combat system and the skill system um, and sorcery so that you can tailor FOA to fit your homebrew. Because to us, homebrewing is hugely important. Um, without it, FOA would never have come into existence. And I, I will be looking forward to seeing how the project develops with t with time. Um, yeah, but we're, with... we're pretty much aware that um, the games masters and players companion went off to the editor yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just waiting for the last uh, few little bits of artwork to come in, mm -hmm. um, and we still we're still online for a December release. Mm -hmm. We were originally going to release on December third. Um, but thanks to Wizards of the Coast, who decided to push all of their uh, new releases out, um, they've got one coming out at the end of November and one coming out on December the 7th. Um, so it's like, great. Um, nobody's going to go and purchase our book when they just, if it gets sandwiched between two major Wizards of the Coast releases. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to push it back a little bit, um, but closer, a little closer to Christmas. Um, and go, right, there you go. But yeah. that's the industry in the end of the day. You mm -hmm. kind of have to deal with that. Oh, yeah. But, with, but um, with that said, I'd like to sincerely thank you once again for taking the time out of your schedule to come back up to the temple. Not a problem. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, as always, the door is always open. Uh, as thank I you say, very much. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> okay, superb. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>